It's October the 31st, 1914, and Europe is in pandemonium. What had been a tenuous balance of fraying geopolitical tensions has now descended into all-out war, with violence on a sheer scale unlike anything the world had ever seen. The Brits, the French, the Germans, the Ottomans, the Russians, and the Austro-Hungarians have all gone to war, and the countries in between are either doing their best to help their preferred faction, or are otherwise just caught up in the buzzsaw. The outlook's bleak, and either side has a real chance of victory. But thousands of kilometers away from the trenches of Europe, a very different battle is about to get underway, as a powerful German fleet under the command of Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee is steaming toward the Chilean coastline. It will be up to the British Royal Navy to oppose him, and if the Royal Navy should fail to stop the Vice Admiral, it's entirely possible that the Falkland Islands would be lost. The two battles that followed would become a last tribute to a sort of naval warfare that no longer exists today, conducted in the heyday of battle cruiser combat with no civilians, no evacuations, no air support, and no third parties to get in the way. The battles of Coronel and the Falklands are among the final classical naval battles that the world ever witnessed. When World War I broke out in the summer of 1914, Europe, Asia, and North America were held together by a tenuous network of alliances, defensive pacts, and trade agreements, all of which were intended to prevent major wars from ever breaking out. But as soon as war did break out, after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by a cadre of Bosnian Serb hitmen, those same alliances brought every major nation on earth into the conflict. As the dominoes fell, massive swaths of territory fell under the de facto control of one side or the other in battle lines that would eventually encompass the entire world world. That was a particular problem for Maximilian von Spee, who, as we mentioned just a moment ago, was a vice admiral in the German Navy. Von Spee had the honor of commanding the German East Asiatic Squadron, a naval squadron of five ships based out of the city of Tsingtao in China's Shandong province on the Yellow Sea. The East Asiatic Squadron was a formidable force, comprised of two armoured cruisers, the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau, as well as two light cruisers, the Emden and the Nuremberg. Apologise to our German viewers for my pronunciation there. Von Spee's troops uh, were well trained and handpicked by the Admiral himself. The ships were top of the line and immaculately maintained, and Von Spee himself well, he was the very model of a modern Navy Admiral. However, he was also trapped an entire continent away from Germany, with enemy forces loyal to Britain that could easily come up the East Asian coast and deal with him. So, Australia too had its own forces to send, and Japan was on the Allies' side as well, just a few hundred kilometers across the sea. Facing the prospect of encirclement, Vice Admiral Von Speed did what any reasonable person would do. He got the hell out of Sing Tower before anybody could come looking for him and his ships. But Von Spee wasn't one to just turn tail and run on back to the Kaiser. Oh no, he was a man, and he was a man at war, and he was going to make the most of that. Von Spee and his ships crossed the Pacific to begin a raiding campaign, attacking British and French trade vessels and rummaging through their various small island holdings. With such well-equipped ships, Von Spee could operate with impunity, and when one of his light cruisers departed to cause trouble in the Indian Ocean, he was reinforced by two others instead, the Leipzig and the Dresden. With a five-fleet ship now under his command, Von Spee set his eyes on the west coast of South America, where a near-continuous line of Allied trade vessels flowed around Cape Horn, ripe for the taking. By this time, the Royal Navy was well aware of what Von Spee was up to, but because they had only limited numbers and quality of ships in the area, they lacked any real means to respond. Rear Admiral Christopher Craddock was the best and closest option with his West Indies squadron, which comprised two aging armoured cruisers, a light cruiser, and a converted ocean liner. The British were more than aware that these ships were not ready to take on such a formidable force as Von Spee was commanding, so they dispatched two additional ships from Europe, an old, nearly obsolete battleship, and a somewhat better armoured cruiser. Craddock's job was to track Von Spee's movements, wait to collect his reinforcements, and then do the best he could do ends the East Asiatic Squadron. The British Admiralty probably saw no reason to be concerned Craddock might not follow his orders. Taking his current fleet into battle against the Germans would be tantamount to suicide. But Craddock appeared to see things differently. Instead of keeping tabs on Von Spee from afar, he took the four ships he had and went looking for his rival himself. 
Luckily for him, that nearly obsolete battleship did eventually arrive, but since it couldn't keep up with the rest of his fleet and its senior engineer was suffering from mental health problems, Craddock left it behind on the 27th of October and sailed out toward Von Spee. He did his best to communicate his intent back to the British Admiralty, but history shows that his situation was lost in the shuffle and wasn't properly dealt with at the time. Craddock had been tracking one of von Spee's cruisers, the Leipzig, which he believed was isolated away from the rest of the German fleet. But what Craddock didn't know was that the rest of the German fleet had caught up to the Leipzig nearly a week before Craddock sailed out from the Falklands to intercept it, and von Spee had enforced radio silence on his other ships to give the appearance that the Leipzig was operating alone. Craddock likely hoped to cut off the Leipzig and deal with it, cutting von Spee's own fleet down to four ships and giving an armoured battle cruiser enough time to catch up with the rest of Craddock's fleet after it had been dispatched from the Mediterranean. But not only had that battle cruiser been waylaid during the trip, unknown to Craddock, but now Craddock was sailing into the moor of von Spee's entire fleet. Setting up this battle, it's not hard to see where the advantage lay. The German fleet was larger by one ship and far more advanced. Its sailors were elite, while the British sailors were mostly inexperienced. The British had an obsolete battleship sitting 300 miles away, and other vessels had nowhere near the firepower that the German fleet could bring. Any element of surprise that Craddock might have had in ambushing the Leipzig was cancelled out by the equal and opposite surprises of finding the entire German fleet training their guns at him. It's unclear whether exactly Craddock intended to survive the battle, although the governor of the Falklands at the time claimed that he understood he was sailing to his death. Regardless, Craddock didn't take advantage of the opportunity to disengage. He had a reputation among his colleagues for being unable to resist a fight as long as he believed himself to have a chance of success, and if the Battle of Coronel is any indication, that reputation was well founded. Both fleets sighted each other at roughly 4.17 p.m. local time, with the British ships traveling northward in a line abreast formation along the coast. Upon identifying his enemy, Admiral von Spee ordered his three fastest ships, two armored cruisers and the Leipzig, to attack the British head-on as the other two light cruisers moved up to support. Craddock appeared to immediately understand his miscalculation. His fleet turned tail and attempted to flee the full German fleet. However, at a distance of just about 12 miles apart, the Germans were able to close in quickly to the slowest British ship, the refitted ocean liner, a Tranto. That vessel could only travel at about 16 knots, whereas the rest of the ships could move at 20, the same speed that the Germans were giving chase. This put Craddock in an impossible situation. Abandon one of his ships where it would no doubt be sunk in order to try and get the others back to their aging battleship 300 miles away or use the full might of his available fleet to try and stand up to the Germans. After 90 minutes of chasing, Craddock made his choice. His ships would have to stand together as best they could. Von Spee took advantage of the setting sun and ensured that the British stayed to his west. When the sun was on the horizon, the British fleet would be backlit clearly and Von Spee's ships could get the clearest shots at range. Both fleets sailed parallel to each other and attempted to try and situate themselves, with the British trying to escape where the sun would frame them and the Germans heading them off constantly. Within a couple of hours at 6.50pm, the sun set on the horizon. Von Spee's fleet closed in and opened fire. The refitted ocean liner, the Atranto, was forced to flee from the fight as the three remaining British ships attempted to fight back. But the two battle cruisers, the Good Hope and the Monmouth, had a fraction of the long-range guns that the Germans did, and many of their guns were situated so low to the water that they risked flooding. At range, the British were sitting ducks, and over the first half hour of battle, they were just picked apart. Urgently, Craddock ordered his three ships to close in so that their smaller guns could reach the enemy, but with no cover and no other choice, this meant that the Germans could focus their fire more accurately. Darkness was no issue at this point, as the fires aboard the Good Hope and the Monmouth made it clear where the British ships were, but the German ships, basically untouched, were veiled in shadow as they continued to pick off their enemies. Within another 20 minutes, both of the British cruisers lost their capacity to return fire. Then first the Good Hope broke apart and sank, and then the Monmouth, which began to dip below the waves under heavy damage before being sunk by one of the German light cruisers. Because of the darkness, Von Spee hadn't realized that the Good Hope had sunk and continued to search. The light cruiser at Glasgow, realizing it was vastly outgunned, departed from the scene under the cover of night. Over 1,600 British officers and sailors died in the battle, including Admiral Craddock. Two of their ships were lost, and Britain suffered its first naval defeat in a hundred years. From the two ships that sank, there were no survivors. In return, the Germans sustained three casualties. Many were wounded aboard the armoured cruiser Geiser now, but they ultimately survived. So, 
Bonsby had utterly thrashed the British, and when the beleaguered Admiralty received word of their defeat, they were forced to share the news with an outraged public. The light cruiser Glasgow warns the old British battleship, the Canopus, that it was best off fleeing, and adding insult to injury, the Canopus proved incapable of even getting back to port. The refitted ocean liner Otranto ventured 200 miles into the open ocean, and then circled back to rendezvous with the others and await further orders. But Admiral Von Spee knew better than to waste time celebrating his victory. During the battle, he had wasted large amounts of precious ammunition, and now he had royally pissed off the Royal Navy with nothing to do but a way to counterattack that was all but guaranteed. Privately, after the battle, Von Spee did not believe that his victory over the British would matter much in the end. After all, any competent admiral probably could have done as much, and he had essentially consigned his own ships to being made outlaws and hunted down. Von Spee knew he might be able to break through against a smaller fleet of Royal Navy cruisers in the Atlantic on the coast of Argentina, but knowing very little about this supposed British battleship in the area except that it existed, the Admiral was hesitant about his next steps. Fearing he might not have enough coal to make the journey, his fleet captured a British coal ship and took its stock, but Von Spee decided to stick around and make absolutely sure that he could make the trip home. He would raid the British Falkland Islands in hopes of gathering any more coal that he could. Meanwhile, over in Britain, the defeat at Coronel led First Sea Lord Sir John Fisher to order a decisive counterattack against the rogue German fleet. Two advanced battlecruisers were dispatched to South America, the Invincible and the Inflexible. They were to rendezvous with the Glasgow, the aforementioned old battleship Canopus, the armoured cruisers Carnivon, Cornwall and Kent, another light cruiser and a merchant cruiser to form a fleet of nine modern, highly formidable ships to face down Von Spee's fleet of five. The battleship Canopus had been grounded on the shore to act as a defensive battery because of its mechanical issues, meaning that if the British could orchestrate a fight at their location of choice, they'd be able to field heavy guns both at sea and on shore. The Royal Fleet sailed under the command of Vice Admiral Doveton Sturdy, an experienced commander who was believed to be a match for Von Spee himself. On December 7, 1914, the British fleet gathered in the harbours of the Falkland Islands. One day later, they received word from a civilian source, one Mrs. Muriel Felton, out at a remote settlement that the German fleet was approaching. Mrs. Felton apparently knew damn well what she was doing, and with her and a maid's help describing the movement of the German ships, the British fleet was able to arrange an ambush. Two of Von Spee's ships arrived first, one heavy cruiser and one light cruiser, but they quickly came under fire from the grounded battleship. Searching their surroundings for British reinforcements, the German ships realized that luck was not on their side. They were able to make out the distinctive tripod masts of two British battlecruisers and found themselves quickly trailed by a smaller British armored cruiser, the HMS Kent. On the British side, Admiral Sturdy appeared unbothered. He ordered his sailors to have their breakfasts and set sail at their own pace, knowing that the canopus on the beach was far too much of a deterrent. Von Spee and his fleet rushed headlong to open water, hoping to avoid the battle entirely. But it was relatively early in the day, and with just 15 miles between them, by the time the British fleet gave chase, there was more than enough time for Sturdy to catch Von Spee by supper. After three and a half hours of running, Admiral Von Spee understood that his entire fleet would not be able to escape. He hoped that that his two slower armoured cruisers could hold off the British long enough that the three light cruisers would be able to escape. Von Spee himself was aboard one of the armoured cruisers and made no attempt to leave. Instead, he took advantage of favourable weather conditions, where a wind caused the British ships to blow their own smoke directly into their line of sight between themselves and the German fleet. After a few easy salvos, the British battle cruisers were able to close in, and the Invincible and the Inflexible went head-to-head -head with the Scharnhorst and the Eisenau. Despite what Von Spee had hoped, the remaining British ships didn't feel compelled to wait around and help out. Instead, they continued chasing the German light cruisers, trusting that their own battle cruisers would be more than enough to finish the job. The Invincible and the Inflexible engaged their targets at range, dealing heavy damage to the Germans while taking only minimal fire in return. Von Spee attempted to get him closer, ready to have his flagship, the Scharnhorst, lit up by enemy fire. Within minutes, the ship sank, and Von Spee and all hands went with her. The Gneiss now continued to fight for another hour, but after running out of ammunition, she was eventually cornered and sunk. 190 sailors would be rescued. The light cruisers, meanwhile, were trying their damnedest to get away. The Nuremberg and the Leipzig, despite their speed, were unable to keep away from their pursuers, and going in their own directions, they were unable to provide covering support to one another. The Nuremberg was cornered by the HMS Kent, which had far better guns and armor, and the chase had pushed the Nuremberg so hard that two of its boilers exploded even before the battle really began. The Nuremberg rolled over and sank a couple of hours after the battle began, leaving the Kent basically unscathed. The Leipzig, by contrast, had it even worse. She was chased by two cruisers, the Glasgow from the original British fleet and the Cornwall. The Leipzig didn't have enough ammunition to sustain a long battle, and after firing off what she had, she rolled over and sank. 
Only 18 men would be recovered from the seas. During the battle, two German support ships would also be sunk, and in total, almost 1,900 officers and sailors would die. In return, the British paid with losses almost as low as the Germans had sustained at Coronel. Ten men had died, and another 19 were wounded. Admiral von Spee's fleet had been utterly destroyed, and the Admiral had gone down with it. So, by the way, had two of his own sons, who served aboard his ships till the end. But if you've been keeping count, you might have realized an anomaly. Admiral von Spee had taken five combat vessels into battle against the British, and only four were sunk. The remaining ship was the light cruiser Dresden, which was able to move fast enough that it outran the ships on its tail and disappeared into the islands around South America. The Dresden was under the command of Captain Fritz Ludecker, but uh, once it escaped the British Navy, Ludecker was no longer the one calling the shots. The ship was essentially stranded off the coast of South America, with numerous warships hunting it down, and it didn't have enough coal reserves on its own to make it back to Germany, even if it could avoid detection. It would have to gather enough coal to make an attempt at the journey while evading detection from the British ships that undoubtedly would be searching for it. The man of the app was the Dresden's intelligence officer, a young man named Wilhelm Canaris. We've actually discussed the career of Canaris at far greater length on our sister channel, Into the Shadows, but after his time on the Dresden, he would eventually become one of the most important little-known figures of all of World War II. But on the Dresden, he was responsible for getting his 360 shipmates home safely, however he possibly could. The British dispatched three ships to hunt down the Dresden. The armoured cruiser Kent, the light cruiser Glasgow, and the armoured merchant cruiser Arama. For five months, Canaris, Ludeca, and their crew evaded their pursuers, stocking up on coal in a series of supply stops and attempting to make their way to the Indian Ocean and get back to raiding. During these months, Canaris was consistently able to stay one step ahead of the British, often misleading them or narrowly avoiding being sighted. It was an effort that would see him made into a minor naval hero in Germany once he returned. But the Dresden's luck couldn't last forever, and on March 8, 1915, the Kent sighted the Dresden as both ships drifted through heavy fog. After an hour's long chase, the Dresden's engines were no longer fit to evade the Kent, and she was cornered in Chile's Cumberland Bay. Captain Ledecker signaled that his ship didn't wish to fight, but the Kent didn't really care very much. The light cruiser Glasgow, which had fought opposite the Dresden at Coronel at the Falklands, and now here, opened fire anyway, and the Kent joined in. The Canaris had one final trick up his sleeve. After Ludeca signaled to the British that he wished to send a negotiator, Canaris was sent out in a light boat to paddle toward the Glasgow, even as the Glasgow continued firing over his head into the Dresden's hull. Ludeca struck the white flag so that the bombardment would cease, and Canaris spoke with the Glasgow's captain, John Luce, aboard his ship. Luce demanded that the Dresden surrender unconditionally, and after Canaris politely explained that Chile had already interned his ship, he paddled back to the Dresden. He and his men vacated the ship, and minutes later, they detonated it, using charges they'd planted in the forward ammunition magazines and engine rooms. The Dresden fell to the bottom of Cumberland Bay, defeated, but out of the reach of the British Empire. With it, World War I's naval battles in South America came to a final and definitive end. Twelve of the Dresden's crew would die in the attack, but the rest would be rescued and interred by Chile, where they would remain for the rest of the war. And so finally, entered the battles of Coronel and the Falklands. After a resounding victory and a stunning defeat on each side, the German East Adriatic fleet was finally destroyed. The Royal Navy redeemed itself after a brutal embarrassment. The Kaiser's ships and naval officers did all they could, and in the aftermath, well over 3,000 souls would be condemned forever to the sea. <laughs>